This is Dr. Dave Mathewson in New Testament History and Literature, Lecture Number 32 on 2 Peter and Jude. Dr. Dave Mathewson. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I know uh, know this is such a nice day, it's hard to be inside, Uh, so I'll make it worth your while if you showed up. I'll have a piece of paper up here, you sign your name on it, after class you'll get extra credit for being here. <clears throat> just I do that once in a while just to reward the faithful remnant. Anyway, uh, all right, and after that I can't change my mind, I've got to go through that. All right, uh, what I want to do today is uh, we are actually getting very near the end. I want to leave a couple days, at least one day perhaps, to uh, look at Revelation in a little bit of detail, although obviously we're running out of uh, some time for that. But uh, I I want to look at two documents today, and uh, this is another time when we'll go out of canonical order. Uh, That is, we will uh, look at two books, so one of that are separated from each other in in their canonical order in the New Testament, but two books that bear a close resemblance that suggest that there's some kind of a relationship between them. Uh, Just as we did with Colossians and Philemon, we suggested there was a a close relationship between them in that they were probably addressed uh, to the same location, sent during a similar time. And uh, if you recall, the New Testament is not arranged chronologically anyway. Uh, The books do not occur in the order in which they were necessarily written. Even when you see a 1st and 2nd Corinthians or 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd Timothy, is we we can't assume necessarily that that's the order in which they were written. Paul did not write 1st and 2nd Timothy on the top of his letter or Peter did not write 1st and 2nd Peter. Those are designations we've given to them according to the order in which they occur in the New Testament, which is roughly by length uh, at at times or logically, not necessarily chronologically. Uh, But there are times when uh, even though the letters uh, may not be arranged chronologically, there may be clues in the letters that help us to determine uh, when they would have been written. And we'll look at uh, one of those examples today with 2 Peter and Jude. Uh, Jude is one of those letters that, at least I can't remember the last time I've ever heard a sermon preached on one, uh, on, uh, or a, a sermon preached on Jude, uh, let alone a reference to it or anything like that. And uh, you'll see why when we look at it in, in just a little bit of detail. But let's open with a prayer, and uh, then we'll look at 2 Peter and Jude. Father, uh, thank you for bringing us uh, to this point in the semester and as we anticipate the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for energy and endurance and, uh, Lord, the, the ability to persevere and uh, not uh, feel too burnt out and discouraged and tired from all that we're doing, but that we'll be able to finish well. And, uh, Lord, I pray that uh, despite the nice weather and other places that we'd rather be and things we'd rather be doing, is you'll help us to focus our attention for just this brief time on uh, just a small portion of what uh, we confess is your very revelation to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, Second Peter. My computer just froze up. Second Peter. Uh, Second Peter is, uh, again, one of those documents that, uh, like a number of Paul's letters uh, uh, that we've seen, could be categorized with, and this, this is important when, uh, when you're thinking in terms of exams, especially the final exam, uh, a lot of my questions sometimes ask you to relate letters or, or, or documents across the New Testament as far as what they might have in similarity uh, with each other. Second Peter is one of those documents that shares features with some of Paul's letters that we've looked at that addresses some kind of a false teaching or some kind of a deviant teaching, uh, uh, such as uh, we saw that uh, First and Second Timothy, uh, books like Colossians and Galatians, Paul was dealing with threats uh, to the gospel that he preached. Now, in Second uh, Peter, unlike First Peter, which was addressing a very different uh, situation, 
Uh, Second Peter is addressing a problem of, of uh, uh, teachers who uh, basically were uh, a, a little bit differently than some of the other letters that we've looked at. Teachers that were promoting a sort of antinomianism, that is, uh, promoting a teaching that uh, absolved one of any authority or responsibility to live life in a certain way. A and uh, it, it, from, from some of the examples we see in Second Peter, we're going to see also that uh, the they were, they were promoting this by questioning and calling into question that God was actually going to, to return and judge. Uh, so uh, one of the ways they did this is by calling into question, we'll see, the teaching of the apostles and the Old Testament prophets. If you remember your Old Testament survey class, uh, one of the dominant messages of the prophets was one of both salvation but judgment as well, that God would return and judge the earth. It seems that these teachers, whatever their precise identity in 2 Peter, were calling into question particularly the fact that that, that God was going to return and judge the earth. Therefore, if that's the case, they could live whatever kind of lifestyle they wanted to. Uh, they, they did, they, and especially, they could indulge in whatever pre pleasures, uh, particularly sexual immorality, and, and uh, out, out of, with no fear that God was going to return and judge. Uh, so that seems to be the, the primary issue or problem. That is, these, these teachers that were, were calling into question the fact that God was really going to turn, return and judge humanity and, and, and judge wickedness and sin. And if, that's, if he isn't, then they are free to live their lives in whatever terms they want. They're free to indulge in any kind of sexual immorality or any pleasures they want because God is not going to return and judge them. And, and that seems to be the issue or the problem that uh, the author is addressing. Now... The problem is, uh, my notes that I'm going to follow are on the overhead. Uh, but let me, uh, for just a moment, talk about the genre or literary type of uh, Second Peter. Second Peter, like Second Timothy, seems to resemble a last will and testament. More extra credit points here. <laughs> uh, Re, much like we, we said, uh, Second Peter was actually uh, Paul's last will and testament uh, to his readers, where uh, uh, we said a testament which was a, a sort of a common literary type in the first century, uh, and uh, leading up to the first century and during that time, a testament uh, basically was the last words of a dying hero, uh, someone who was uh, ready to die, was passing on their final instruction. And uh, First Peter resembles that as well. And especially verses 12 through 15, listen to these verses. Uh, Peter says, Therefore, I intend to keep on reminding you of these things, though you know them already and are established in the truth that has come to you. I think it is right, as long as I am in the body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death or my departure will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. That, that statement has all the earmarks of a testament. Uh, that is, the, the, the last words of a dying hero, as a hero faces death, he now passes on his parting instructions uh, to remind his readers of what he has said to them and what he has taught them. And so, thank you very much. There we go. All right. Uh, so, so Peter, in a sense, then, is, is writing a testament much like Second, uh, Second Timothy. We'll return to this in a moment. But uh, as I said, the, 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 primary, uh, kind of the primary force behind the false teachers is that they are trying to, or teaching or trying to convince the readers that, uh, to deny future judgment or that there will not be a future judgment. Therefore, they can live however they want and pursue any kind of immorality that they want. So that the purpose of 2 Peter is then Peter then writes to encourage his readers to pursue holy living in the world by maintaining their confidence in Scripture primarily and in the fact that God is going to come and ju both judge and save. 
So, so in one sense, Peter's message is very prophetic. Uh, by that I mean he, he, he tries to motivate his readers by reminding them of, uh, uh, and communicating a message of both salvation for those who are faithful, but, but, but judgment for those who refuse. The, the other thing that's important about this, and, and this will crop up again in Jude, is, uh, and we've seen this a couple other times, when, when we think about false teaching uh, to, today, we, we usually think in intellectual or theological terms that, that someone who is engaged in false teaching is one who deviates theologically or, or, or one that deviates from, uh, from, from uh, uh, clear scriptural teaching. However, it's interesting that the biblical authors were just as interested in ethical deviation as well. And we're going to see in... In 2 Peter, 2 Peter is not only concerned that they don't believe the correct things, but they act incorrectly as, as well. Or as some would say, he's not only concerned with orthodoxy, but orthopraxy. Uh, that is, uh, fa false teaching is just as much a deviant lifestyle as it is a, a deviant manner of teaching. So that would uh, be the purpose under uh, your notes. Now, the way P Peter accomplishes his purpose is, is this. It appears that in the rest of his letter, Peter is going to, uh, Peter is going to take up objections of these teachers. Again, remember, these teachers are calling into question the fact that God is going to judge and therefore they can live lives however they want. What it seems that's going to happen is Peter is going to take up a series of objections to the, to, to Jesus, the fact that Christ is not going to return and God is not going to come back and judge. And, and Peter is going to answer these objections. Uh, so objection number one. And again, you'll notice the verses, the, the chapters and verses don't correspond with the entirety of 2 Peter, but I'm just focusing on the heart uh, of each section. So uh, we're, we'll, we'll just move through 2 Peter simply looking at the, the objection that the false teachers were raising to Christ coming to, to judge, and then Peter's response to that. So the first objection was that the, the apostles were teaching myth in chapter 1. Uh, uh, verses 16 through 19. So these verses, again, Peter is not necessarily quoting the teachers, but I think summarizing what is at the heart of one of their objections. So he says, For, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now that phrase, we did not follow cleverly devised myths, probably is summarizing one of the accusations of the teachers. That is, that the apostles, such as Peter and Paul and others, were, were uh, simply teaching myth. And what is important about that is one of the messages of the apostles was that G indeed Jesus was going to return one day and he was going to judge the world. So by discrediting the apostolic message that Christ was going to return, that is the already, or I'm sorry, the not yet part of our already but not yet tension, by, by the, the apostles teaching the, that, uh, the not yet, that Christ is one day going to return to judge, by calling that into question, the false teachers then would uh, promote their antinomianism. That is, they are not responsible for any, any kind of code of conduct or, or ethical conduct. So the, uh, the teachers are calling into question the apostolic teaching. The answer of Peter is no. The apostles were eyewitnesses of God's glory. Now listen to this. This is interesting. Peter says, for he received, referring to Christ, for Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. What is that event referring to? Does anyone remember? Now you have to go back to the Gospels. Where did, the, where did at least some of the apostles go up in a mountain and, and hear a voice, this is my beloved son, listen to him. In him I am well pleased. 
the transfiguration. All, all the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the transfiguration, a time when Jesus went with Peter, James, and John up a mountain and was transfigured before them, was changed. And uh, they indeed, heard, and there, it was enveloped in a cloud. It was a, a rather supernatural event. And they heard the voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, which comes out of the book of Isaiah. What, why do you think, why do you think Peter quotes that? I mean, how, how is this a response to the... How, how is this going to prove that when, when the apostles said that Jesus was going to come back and judge, they were not teaching falsity or teaching myth? How does this prove that? Why, I mean, why, why would Peter allude to this event? Because I feel like there is some kind of Old Testament backing to it. Okay. Okay, yeah, right, yeah, it's, it, it is the transfiguration event in the Gospels actually is filled with all kinds of Old Testament imagery. It, it was basically, in a sense, a kind of a glimpse, a, 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 it, it was almost a, a, a kind of a prefiguring or a, a, a glimpse ahead of time of Jesus coming in all his glory in his kingdom to judge and to save. So the reason Jesus, Peter quotes us is, no, we, we were eyewitnesses of God's glory at the transfiguration. That is, we saw a glimpse. We had a snapshot or a glimpse into what it would be like when Christ will return in all his glory to set up his kingdom and to judge and to save. So, so they, they kind of had a glimpse of the not yet already in the present when they saw Jesus transformed in all his, his glory and power as the Son of God that would return and judge and provide salvation. So Peter says, no, we, we were eyewitnesses of the fact that Jesus is going to come back and judge. We were not, we were not, when, the, when the apostles taught that Christ was going to come back and judge, they were not teaching myth. Or, or, or a falsity, but instead they, it was based on an eyewitness. They themselves saw Christ, kind of a snapshot, a prejudgment glimpse of Christ coming in all his glory when he was transfigured on, on that mountain in the Gospels. Objection number two. The prophets were simply wrong. Uh, chapter 1 and verses 20 and 21 uh, first of all, Peter says, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will or decision, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. Now, most likely then, this is an, a, a response to or a summary of, of the, uh, of the false teacher's objection, and that is the prophets were simply wrong. Again, when you go back and read the Old Testament prophetic texts, one of the, the common features of the prophets, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, Isaiah, etc., is that they also envisioned a day when God would intervene and set up his kingdom and bring both salvation and judgment. And so now, by, the, the, by calling into question the prophets, they were calling, the false teachers were calling into question their message of judgment. So again, if, if, if the prophets were wrong, and it, therefore there's no judgment. And if there's no judgment, therefore you can live however you want. We will not be responsible for our immoral actions. Peter's response, as we just read, is no, the prophets were not speaking on their own. They were not wrong. Uh, they were not simply uh, cleverly devised prophecies, but instead they were speak men and women speaking as those moved along by God. Uh, theologians often describe prophets as the mouthpiece of God, and this is one of the texts that they get that idea from. How, how, however much their own style and communication was involved, uh, Peter makes it clear that ultimately God's Spirit was moving the prophets uh, to speak this message of judgment and salvation. So when the prophets said that God was coming back to save and to judge, uh, they're to be trusted because Peter says uh, their, their message is not one that is, is by their own decision and human will and their own, uh, the, it's not of their own doing, but they, they are proclaiming a message uh, that uh, God's Spirit has moved them to proclaim. Therefore, uh, if, there is, if the prophets were correct and right, then their message that there is a judgment is correct, and then therefore it does matter how the readers live. 
All right, so uh, objection number two answered. Objection number three. Uh, judgment simply will not happen uh, in chapter 2. Peter's response to that, and I won't read this, uh, this section, but it, it basically just, uh, it, it, it seems to suggest the teachers were, were simply arguing that it's, it's just logically and, and theoretically impossible and pragmatically impossible that judgment would take place. What Peter does in chapter 2 is Peter actually accumulates a number of Old Testament stories. If you go back and read Peter 2, you'll just see one story after another from the Old Testament, almost kind of an Old Testament survey. But what it is, it's a story of how God has intervened and judged in the history of Israel. And you can see Peter's point for doing this. He's saying, no, it, 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 it isn't unlikely that God will judge it. It is not theoretically impossible. God has done so in the past. Look at Israel's history. God has judged in the past. So it's, it's, com entirely, in, it's entirely conceivable and it's certain that he will judge in the future. So once again, the, the false teachers are wrong by calling into question the plausibility of judgment. Uh, one, Peter says one only needs to look at the Old Testament to see that, that God has frequently intervened to judge in the past. And so he will uh, uh, in the future as well. Objection number four in chapter 3, 1 through 10 is the false teachers also seem to be saying that the fact that God has delayed, the, the fact that God has not intervened to judge suggests that there's not going to be a judgment. In other words, the, 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 fact, that, the fact that Christ has not come back for some time, uh, despite what the apostle said, despite, despite what the prophet said, it demonstrates that there's not going to be a judgment. Otherwise, why, why the delay? Again, Peter's answer. In chapter 3, 1 through 10. Uh, he says, uh, I'll start with verses 8 through 10. Peter says, But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some of you think about slowness but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, which using a metaphor that Jesus himself used, will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and everything that is done on it will be revealed or disclosed. So basically Peter's answer is, uh, that, that, uh, that interesting, although I'm not entirely what to sure, what, uh, sure what to make of the language of, of a, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. Slowness to God is not like slowness to us. But then he also adds, but, but he's also giving humanity a chance to repent. So whatever we pr precisely make of this, at the least, Peter is saying that delay, the fact that there's a delay has a reason. It does not call into question uh, it does not call into question the fact that God is indeed going to return and judge. What might seem like a delay to us may not necessarily be a delay. And he says, and by the way, God may be uh, delaying so that others have, a, so that many have a chance to repent uh, prior to the coming judgment. Uh, so that's, that's basically Peter in uh, the, the book of Second Peter in a nutshell. Uh, again, it seems to me that uh, uh, what Peter's strategy then is to, in combating these teachers that are uh, trying to call into question the fact that there's going to be a future judgment and therefore the readers can do whatever they want, what Peter does is he seems to take up a series of objections or possible objections by the false teachers and, and replies to them and responds to them. 
So that the conclusion then is, if there is going to be a judgment, then it, it does matter how the readers live. So he, he asks them and he motivates them to live holy lives in view of the fact that there indeed is a coming judgment and not to be duped uh, by these false teachers that are calling that judgment into question and suggesting that they can live antinomian type lives. Right, any, any questions about Second Peter? There's one other thing I want to say about it, and that is Second Peter is one of the books that uh, perhaps more than any other book in the New Testament uh, has uh, been disputed as far as whether Peter wrote it or not. Even, even many that would agree that Peter wrote 1 Peter, a, a number of them would disagree that he wrote 2 Peter for a number of reasons. Uh, when you compare 1 and 2 Peter, even in English translation sometimes, the, but especially if, if uh, all of you were able to read the Greek text of 1 and 2 Peter, if I gave you a Greek New Testament and you were fairly fluent in your ability to read it, you'd have a lot easier time with 1 Peter than you would with 2 Peter. I guarantee it. So some have suggested the, 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 the writing style, the, the, the type of Greek, the vocabulary is just so different in 2 Peter than it is from 1 Peter that uh, Peter could not have written it. Uh, another reason is because we just said that uh, 2 Peter resembles very closely in form a testament. Uh, we, we said there in, in the, uh, from roughly the second century into the, uh, uh, or a couple of centuries before the first century and into the first century and beyond, there was a common form known as, a, as testamentary literature, as a testament, that is a record of the, the last words of a dying hero that would include both ethical and sometimes prophetic or, or, or eschatological type of instruction, which you find in First in Second Peter. Uh, interestingly, most of those testaments tend to be pseudonymous. That is written in the name of. Uh, that, that is, uh, for example, we'll talk in just a moment. We we have, uh, uh, for example, we have a number of books titled the Testament of Abraham, the Testament of Isaac, the Testament of Jacob, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, a Testament of Moses. Uh, uh, a testament of Elijah, but but the thing is, they're they're obviously written not by those persons. In other words, the testament of Abraham was not really written by Abraham. It was written by someone after Abraham's life, writing in Abraham's name. And uh, the the assumption is that the readers would have understood that they would not have been tricked or deceived into thinking that Abraham was really writing this, but they would have known this is just a recognizable genre or, or literary form, and they would have known that uh, Abraham or whoever did not write this. Some have argued because Second Peter is a form of a testament, like other testaments, it too is probably pseudonymous. Uh, that is, that someone after Peter's death now writes in Peter's name as someone did in Abraham's name or Moses' name or Isaac's name, some well-known figure from the past. Now someone writes in Peter's name uh, to instruct the, the present-day readers. And again, the assumption is the readers would not have been deceived into thinking that uh, Peter actually wrote this, that the author was not trying to trick them. Uh, but, but he was just following a standard con literary convention of writing in the name of someone else. Uh, so for that reason, some think that uh, Second Peter is, is pseudonymous. Another reason is what, uh, is, is what some scholars call early Catholicism. That is, uh, there, there's a sense that we can determine and kind of tease out of the literature in the first and second century uh, a, a, a movement within Christianity that scholars call early Catholicism. And, and basically what it is, it's a label for the belief and thinking and the, the state of the church late in the first century and into the second century as it began to settle into life 
and prepare for kind of for the long run. That is, they, they realize that Christ was not going to come back right away, and so they kind of begin to settle in and they're prepared to live out their life in the world. They become more institutionalized, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, usually it's thought that early Catholicism, and by Catholicism I'm not using that term uh, in reference to the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church as we think of it, uh, Catholicism was a term that simply referred uh, to the church universal, the church more generally and broadly. Uh, hence, you often find, we, we said that uh, the, the collection of books that we're looking at now are often labeled the general epistles. Another name for them is the Catholic epistles because they're addressed to the church more broadly, the, the Catholic, the universal church. So that's what I mean by early Catholicism, that is, the, the church as it, as it has now spread out and, and now begins to settle in and establish itself. There's, uh, it's often been thought that there, is three, there are three characteristics of early Catholicism, that is, the church towards the end of the first century and into the second century A.D. Uh, number one is a fading of a belief in the soon return of Christ. I shouldn't say a fading of the soon return, it's a fading of the belief. So the assumption is very early on, perhaps based on Jesus' teaching and the apostles' teaching, such as we read in 1 Thessalonians, the, the church was, uh, had a vibrant expectation that Christ was coming back soon. Uh, right away. But, but now, as, as it becomes apparent, as he delays, it become, as it becomes apparent that Christ is not coming back right away, the, 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 the church, their, their expectation of a soon return of Christ kind of begins to fade into the background. And again, they, they, they kind of begin to settle down to live life in the world. Another feature of early Catholicism that goes along with this is institutional, institutionalization of the church. That is, as the church begins to settle into the world and settle in kind of for the long run and realize Christ is not coming back immediately, then there's a need for the church to become more institutionalized and more structured with, with bishop, deacons and bishops and a hierarchy, etc. A third one is the crystallization of the faith. There, there's more of a need to have a, a fairly set uh, 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 a fairly set um, uh, kind of body of beliefs that the, the, the church will now hold to and subscribe to. And so it's thought that all three of these can be found in Second Peter. Therefore, the, the, the reasoning is, if, if all three of these ideas, wherever you see these ideas, if they indicate a church that has been around for a while, late into the first century, into the second century, and if these are all found in Second Peter, then they must, this must be a later document that Peter himself could not have or did not write. Uh, again, I don't want to go into this, but uh, number one, I, I would really question whether the church really changed substantial, this substantially. Uh, in fact, I think that, uh, number one, I, I doubt that the first one is, is necessarily the case. Uh, you still, it, it seems to me throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you find both delay and imminence of God's return uh, balance with each other. We already saw that Paul seemed to, and back in 2 Thessalonians, think that there could be a delay, that Christ might not come back immediately. Remember, he warned the Thessalonians not to think that they are already in the day of the Lord. So it, 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 to me, it doesn't seem like, in, in some of these documents that are thought to be much, much later, it, it doesn't seem like the, the soon return of Christ has necessarily faded out of view. Uh, and these two seem to me to be more a, a matter of, of extent than, than their presence. Because, I, again, I think you can find both institutionalization of the church and crystallization of the faith in some of the early New Testament documents. So I really doubt, I really doubt that the presence of any three of these are, are good enough to tell that this document must be much later. So, in conclusion, it, it seems to me that there's really, although Second Peter is a difficult book, as far as to uh, demonstrate that uh, Peter definitely wrote it, I don't think that there's really good reason to question it. Uh, why couldn't Peter, for example, write his own testament? 
there may be other reasons why 2 Peter looks so different from 1 Peter, but there, there's really not enough evidence to uh, certainly to 100% be certain that Peter wrote it, but there's really not good evidence to deny that, that he wrote it as well. The early church's testimony was that, that Peter did indeed write it. So I'm going to operate with the assumption that, uh, that Peter, uh, Jesus' apostle, the same person that wrote, wrote 1 Peter, uh, wrote this book also. Yeah, that, that's you're right. That's another issue. There's even there's even less than we have. Paul, we uh, basically all we have is First and Second Peter. Uh, we we really don't have enough again to say well Peter couldn't have written this. Uh, remember, we said even statistics are even difficult with Paul's letters. Even though we have a number of letters of Paul, there's still not enough to definitively conclude this is how Paul always wrote or Paul couldn't have written like this. So probably even less certain with Peter since we only have basically first and second Peter to go on as far as how Peter would have written or could have written. All right, as kind of a transition into the next book, which now we're going to skip ahead to the next, to the last book, the penultimate book of the New Testament, and that is Jude. But as kind of a transition is, interestingly, when you compare Second Peter and Jude, you soon notice a number of similarities. Similarities that are often to the same extent of agreement as Matthew, Mark, and Luke were. There's a similarity of ideas, there's a similarity in even down to vocabulary and wording between cert, uh, certain sections of 2 Peter and Jude. And the similarities are great enough that uh, we need to raise a question, what might be the relationship between 2 Peter and Jude? It's, it's doubtful that they're just coincidental. Most likely there is, is some kind of a relationship. Either 2 Peter and Jude were borrowing on a, a similar tradition or similar stories that they both had at their disposal, or one of the documents borrowed and was aware of the other. Uh, I, I, again, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but it seems that the common, uh, what is commonly, uh, be, I think, becoming more agreed upon now is probably Jude was written first, and Second Peter then utilized most of Jude. In fact, much of Jude you find in Second Peter, but then Second Peter has a lot of material not in Jude. So most likely, Second Peter or the author Second Peter had access to Jude and utilized Jude, or at the very least, had, a, had access to the exact same collection of stories that Jude had, and then uh, uses those stories and then adds his own material as well. So I, I would suggest probably Jude is written first, and then Second Peter utilized Jude, but other material. Yep. Yeah, again, I see it's possible it could be the other way around that, that Jude could have borrowed from 2 Peter, and that would explain the similarities. The, the difficulty is on that reading, you might have a little bit more difficulty explaining then why Jude would be written if, if it, I mean, if it resembles 2 Peter so closely, but then leaves out a lot of Peter. Uh, you know, why, why, why would you just pick up part of Peter and not follow the rest of him? Whereas it, it does make a little bit more sense the other way around to say Peter used all of Jude, but then at, wanted to expand and add some of his own material. But uh, again, you can see the order in which the books occur in the New Testament are not necessarily indicative of the order in which they were written. But, uh, yeah, it, Again, the common view seems to be Jude was written first and then Second Peter, but certainly it, it still it could be the other way around. Now. The next obvious question is, why, why the book of Jude? First of all, why do you think, 
just to kind of raise a question, it's not necessarily in your notes, but just to think a little bit, why would a book like Jude be included in the New Testament? I mean, especially since, especially since a lot of it is already, as we said, it's already in Second Peter. You, you can find virtually everything in Jude already in Second Peter. Why would, why would a book like Jude, and as we're going to see in a moment, there, Jude is one of the most strange books you've ever read, at least I've ever read in the New Testament. I used to think Revelation was strange, and it, it still is in some respects, but Jude, is, Jude has some very weird, uh, weird material in it. In fact, listen, we'll, we'll talk more about this one. But uh, this is how Jude writes. He says, now, I desire to remind you, though you, have, are, are fully not, uh, you are fully informed, that the Lord, who was once for all saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their own position, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept them in eternal and deepest darkness for judgment of the great day. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which in the same manner as they indulge in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, they serve an ex as an example. Yet in the same way, these dreamers also defiled the flesh, rejected authority, and slandered the glorious ones. But when Ar the archangel Michael contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare bring an accusation against him. Well, what in the world is that about? And, and this, this whole section of, uh, of uh, Jude has a, a, a couple of rather strange stories like this. So due to its brevity, due to the fact that much, most of it is already in Second Peter anyway, why do you think a book like this may have been accepted into the New Testament canon? And part of the issue is, who is Jude? Say, I heard it. Somebody said it. Allison would. Jesus' brother. Jude is one of Jesus' brothers. That is probably one of the reasons why Jude would make it into the New Testament canon. Uh, being uh, much like James, uh, who is Jesus' brother, is Jude being a relative of Jesus, being one of Jesus' brothers, uh, it's, it's likely then that his book would get consideration for being included in the New Testament. Very good. Uh, now, the purpose of Jude then, Jude then uh, naturally, because it has so much of the same material as Second Peter, however you understand the relationship, naturally, Jude also seems to be combating an antinomianism type of teaching as was true with Second Peter. That is, again, teaching that one can pursue all kinds of sexual immorality and indulge in any kind of desires and pleasures that one wants with no responsibility or under no authority at all. That seems to be the heart of the false teachers behind Jude. Yet, it's, again, there's question exactly where was Jude written? Who, who was Jude written to? What are the precise readers? Where were they? What was the nature of this teaching? Some have suggested Gnostic type teaching. I, I have no idea. There's, uh, it, it, it could have been more of a Jewish type, although it'd be hard to see why they would be promoting uh, the kind of lifestyle that you read about. Uh, apparently, the verse that I just read he said, yet in the same way, these dreamers, that's, Peter, that's Jude's label for the teachers, these dreamers also defile the flesh, reject authority, and slander the glorious ones. Uh, so, I, I'm not entirely sure exactly who the, who the teachers were or where they would have been located, but from best we can tell from reading Jude, the, again, like the teachers in Second Peter, they were questioning uh, they were calling into question the, the need to live responsibly and, and instead promoting an antinomianism that is living with no, under no authority, uh, indulging in all the lust and pleasure that one, one wants uh, and not have, having to worry about judgment or anything like that as, as a consequence. That seems to be what uh, Jude is addressing. Uh, so very, very similar to, to uh, Second Peter. Though it's, it's not as clear in Jude that they're denying a coming judgment or anything like that. Uh, in Second Peter, uh, Jude, too, Jude may have been addressing 
when you start reading a lot of the documents, even outside of the New Testament in early Christianity, what one of the problems the early church faced was kind of itinerant preachers and groups of individuals who would kind of go from town to town and promote different teachings and, and uh, actually teach uh, things such as one might find in Jude. So there's some suspicion that Jude, whoever he's, ad he's addressing, that his readers may be subject to these itinerant preachers that are kind of moving from place to place and traveling around uh, uh, teaching this uh, idea of uh, this antinomian idea that one is, is not responsible to, uh, I mean, we, we don't have to worry about judgment and one can live however one wants and pursue all the pleasures uh, that, that uh, you choose to. And so, like Second Peter then, Jude is going to respond to that uh, to convince his readers not to, uh, not to give in to that. For, so, for example, in verse 3, the purpose, of, uh, the purpose of Jude seems to be summarized in verse 3. Beloved, while eagerly preparing to write to you about the salvation we share, which suggests Jude apparently was going to sit down and write a letter, but now has received this information that is troubling, and now he's going to switch courses and write something else. So it says, Beloved, while eagerly preparing to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write an appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. That seems to summarize uh, Jude's purpose. He, he wants them to contend for the faith. But, but, but he will make it clear, though, as we'll see in the letter, the, the faith that he talks about is not only an assent to some body of belief, but it has everything to do with their ethics and the way they live as well. So Jude then writes to address this problem of false teaching, perhaps these itinerant teachers who are teaching this antinomianism, to warn them not to give in to that, but instead to contend for the faith, both theologically and morally and ethically, uh, to, to contend for the faith that has been delivered to them. Now, the way Jude does this, uh, and this is, uh, this is, I think, how you understand the letter, Basically, the way Jude will do this, the way he will get them to, to resist this antinomian influence and contend for the faith, is he will, like 2 Peter in chapter 2, he is going to tell a number of stories. And what these stories all have in common, they, two things. Number one, they come from the Old Testament. So almost the whole book of Jude is just this list of stories from the Old Testament. Number two, they all have to do with God judging evil and wicked behavior, especially immorality. So for example, notice the first one we looked at, starting at verse 5. Verse 5, and Jude only has one chapter, so there's no chapter 1, chapter 2, it's all verses. So verse 5 begins, Now I desire to remind you, though you are fully informed, that the Lord who once for all saved a people out of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. So although he saved his people out of Egypt, because of their rebellion and disobedience, he destroyed them when they wandered in the desert. And he basically killed them off and raised up a new generation who would now enter the promised land. So Jude is saying, in the same way, even if God did not spare his own, his own people, whom he delivered out of Egypt because of the rebellion. Then he goes on and says, And the angels who did not keep their own position, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains and judgment. But this one, likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which in the same manner as they, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, serve as, as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. That one really summarizes the heart of James' examples. That he's, he's giving examples of those who have rebelled in the Old Testament especially in the, the area of immorality, and then God has judged them. The implication being, then, that the readers better be aware of giving in to these antinomian false teachers. Because if God has judged in the past, he certainly can, and he certainly will do so again for the same kinds of behavior that people were judged for in the Old Testament. That's his whole argument. However, you'll notice in the notes, there, I, I've given you a couple of interesting, uh, just a couple of these examples that are, 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 are kind of intriguing. What about in verse 6, the angels who did not keep their positions of authorities? 
We already looked at, uh, at uh, this example in 1 Peter. I suggested that, uh, that uh, remember the 1 Peter 3 passage that we spent some time on? Uh, this idea of Christ going to the spirits in prison who had, who, who, uh, uh, who had rebelled in the days of Noah and now we're in prison awaiting judgment. That probably comes from this tradition in Jewish literature that interpreted Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God who came down and, and had relations with the daughters of men, interpreted the sons of God as angelic beings who now, according to Jewish literature, who now are in prison, in chains, awaiting the day of judgment. And now I think, I think 2 Peter is repeating the same story. 2 Peter verse 6 is repeating that same story in slightly different wording as we found in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. So uh, 1, Peter, uh, 1 Peter verse 6, or 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter verse 6 then alludes to Genesis chapter 6 as interpreted in Jewish literature, which read it as angelic beings who transgressed who, who abandoned their positions and transgressed God's boundaries and therefore were locked up in judgment, in chains, awaiting the final day of judgment. And, and Peter again alludes to that. And obviously it's a, a very good example for what he wants to prove. Uh, that that uh, their, their immoral actions or their actions that uh, uh, thwarted authority uh, actually have, have dire consequences, that is judgment. But what about this one in verse 9 that we just read? But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses, he did not dare bring a condemnation or slander against him. But he said, to the, Lord, but he said the Lord rebuke you. Now my question is, what, what in the world is that referring to? Uh, first of all, where do you read about the death of Moses in the Old Testament? Anyone remember where that is? Or just roughly? Yeah, Deuteronomy. Towards the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, in, in fact, we, you actually don't read a whole lot about the actual death or, or you don't read anything about the burial of Moses or anything like that. But I would, I would challenge you to read Deuteronomy, read the whole Old Testament, and find this story in there anywhere. It, it's not there. There's no mention anywhere, especially in Deuteronomy, there's no mention anywhere of, of the archangel Michael. You read about him in the Old Testament. You read about him in Revelation and some other Jewish literature. But, but you, you will not find anywhere in Deuteronomy or the Old Testament this story of, of the archangel Michael disputing with Satan over the body of Moses after his death. You, I mean, you'll find that nowhere. So the question is, what in the world is, is Jude doing? Did, did he make this up? Or, or uh, are we missing part of the Old Testament? Or where does he get this? Actually, there is a Jewish work that is not in the Old Testament or New Testament. Uh, we've already referred to testaments, testamentary literature, like the Testament of Abraham, the Testament of Isaac. We said 2 Peter and 2 Timothy resemble Testament. We do have a work called the Testament of Moses. And according to some other literature written around that time, the Testament of Moses at one time had, a had an ending that has now apparently been lost, an ending that did have the story of the archangel Michael disputing with Satan over the body of Moses. It had that exact story. So most likely... Jude probably is relying, not just in the Old Testament, but some of the stories, some of the ways other Jewish literature interpreted the Old Testament. Uh, again, go to Deuteronomy. You, you'll never find that, or the whole Old Testament, you'll never find that story of the archangel Michael disputing with Satan over the body of Moses anywhere. But apparently it was in a work, again, the, called the Testament of Moses, that you can actually read an English translation of it, but you won't find this story because apparently it has, been, it has been lost. But other literature written during the time does tell us that at one time, the Testament of, of Moses apparently had this ending uh, that, that had this story about the devil and Archangel Michael disputing and arguing over what to do with the body of Moses. 
And uh, unless some other evidence turns up, that's most likely where Jude got it. Uh, but again, more importantly, as I said, is to understand the purpose and the function of all these stories is simply, to, even if some of them are a little bit uh, strange to us and hard to understand, is the overall function of all these stories in Jude is to demonstrate that just in the same way that God has judged evil and wickedness in the past, He will do so again. Therefore, the readers need to do everything they can not to give in to these, this antinomian teaching. But instead, as, as uh, Jude ends in verse 24, uh, Jude's final call is now to him who is able to keep you from falling, that is, uh, falling away from the faith that they are to contend for, which includes their obedience and their ethics and their holiness. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. So that's his goal from the readers. That they don't give in to these the antinomian teachers, but they take to heart these Old Testament examples of God judging evil and wickedness, and instead they pursue holiness. And therefore, instead of standing before God in judgment, they will one day stand without blemish in his presence. And, and in his glory. All right, any questions about Jude? Again, a very short book, but uh, has anyone ever heard, in, in, ever heard a sermon preached on Jude? Be, I don't think I ever have. I can't. You can kind of see why when you read the book. It's, uh, some things I aren't sure what to do with. But overall, I think the message of it's pretty clear. Yeah, question? Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think the primary reason, again, for including Jude was mainly in the credentials of who Jude was as Jesus' brother. But, uh, again, I, I think one of the things it does within the broader canon is reinforce the message that, that, uh, uh, that the, the church would not tolerate antinomianism and, and uh, uh, rejection of authority and disobedience, but that they, they took that seriously and that, that God's people are called to, to pursue holiness uh, and, and to, to live lives of holiness uh, so that as Jude ends, that we'll stand without blemish in God's presence rather than uh, facing his wrath and judgment. So it, it, it more or less, ref, I think, reinforces what Peter does in a little bit different way. But mainly, as I, I think a lot of it was on the laurels of who, who Jude was as Jesus' brother that, that ensured that it would get into the New Testament. Good. All right. Hey, have a great weekend. And uh, I'll see you Monday. By the way, next Thursday, right now, I'll send you an email for sure, but next Thursday, uh, I am planning to have an extra, there'll be another extra credit review session. Oh, yeah, there is, thanks for reminding me. Uh, I have a sheet up here. If you come up and sign your name, you'll get extra credit for coming today. This was Dr. Dave Mathewson in New Testament History and Literature, lecture number 32 on Second Peter and Jude.